So the first question all my clients ask me when they're moving to Boise is, which lender should I use? Are all lenders created equally? And the answer is no, different lenders have different strengths. So in this video, I sit down with a correspondent lender and ask him, what is a correspondent lender and what areas of lending do you excel in? And then in the next couple of videos, I sit down with a broker lender and a banker lender and ask them the same questions so you can see how they compare. So I recommend that you watch all three videos so you can see what strengths uh, different lenders have. And as always, if you have any questions about the real estate market here in the Treasure Valley or the area in general, please reach out to me. I'm always happy to help. First of all, tell us what is a correspondent lender? Yeah, correspondent lender is basically between banking and um, brokering. A correspondent lender is generally defined as a company that process, originates, process, underwrites, closes the loan in their own name, and then servicing rights are sold in the mortgage-backed securities market after the fact. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean we won't service it. We service a lot of our loans. We sell a lot of servicing, but what it does mean is from origination to closing, we're in control. So it's all in-house, basically. All in-house. Yeah. yeah, we we process it, we underwrite it, we close it all under Guild Mortgage. So we have total control over all steps of those processes. Mm -hmm. And maybe that might lead to the next question that I have here. What are some of what like what does your company do best? What are some of the strengths of a correspondent lender? Yeah, uh, there's a few that I think are really noteworthy. Uh, one, a correspondent lender has local control like we talked about. My processor, my underwriter, they're here, they're on my team. So if I bring a loan, it's not me versus them, it's we're on the same team. How do we make sure that this loan checks all the boxes for delivery to the secondary market? But also, how do we make sure that we're giving the borrower the best opportunity to qualify? Mm -hmm. So my underwriters are on my team, my processors are on my team, we're working together to make sure that this that this loan gets closed if it's closable. Mm -hmm. Have you found that that actually works out to be more efficient in like a quicker process because they're in-house? Or like how does it compare to somebody that would maybe not, not be in-house? What, what would be some of the advantages, I guess, to having an underwriter in-house? Yeah, it can be. So first of all, availability, accessibility. Mm -hmm. So if I've got a question on a weird uh, K1 from an S-Corp and I need an answer like in an hour, I can call, I can Teams chat mm -hmm. if she's in the office and you know they work from home a lot too, but I can run in her office and say, hey, help me out with this. So I can get an answer quickly mm -hmm. rather than emailing a help desk mm -hmm. and waiting a day or two. Mm -hmm. uh, that's one thing. Uh, the other thing is when it comes down to files that for whatever reason we have a rush, maybe we had to delay appraisal or we had delayed borrower stocks, because the underwriters, processors, and closers all work for our company, I can have a rush request. I can reach out to them and say, I'm so sorry to do this, but I need this in like two hours. Or, mm -hmm. you know, not that we can always be successful with that, but again, we're on the same team. I'm not relying on another company to right. approve a rush request. It's all us. Right. So, so whereas like in a practical situation, if there's something that goes wrong or something that maybe you not necessarily goes wrong, but that you overlooked, right? Sure. And so you, you're two days before closing and you notice that something wasn't brought to your attention, then you can get that done very quickly rather than having to delay closing, basically. Absolutely, I, I was at a closing table a week ago Friday. At the closing table, we got from the builder an escrow withhold addendum. Wow, at, at the table? At the table. That's pretty cool. At the table. Yeah. So I called my closer, I called my underwriter and said, uh, I've got an escrow withhold addendum. This file now has to go back through underwriting. There's title docs to be added. We have to restructure the loan closing docs. So our signing was at 11 a.m. We finished signing about 12, 15, 12, 30, fun and recorded same day. Wow, that's really cool. We don't like doing that, by the right. way, but if, <laughs> right. but if the emergency happens, we yeah. have the people on the team locally to make okay. sure that that closing doesn't get delayed. Um, what type of loans do you do most? Are there certain loans that you don't do or what so, are most common loans maybe that you do? Yeah, most common loans that we would say are anything conventional, which is your Fannie Freddie, Mm -hmm. um, government GSC loans, FHA, VA, USDA, Jumbo. Those are probably the, the most common mm -hmm. loans done in correspondent. We can do broker loans. Mm -hmm. I often don't, uh, I'm a big fan of staying in my lane. Mm -hmm. And because I don't broker a lot, I'm not as comfortable with that process. And I wanna make sure the client is with someone that is really familiar with that process. Mm -hmm. So anything correspondent essentially means anything that there's an investor for. Mm -hmm. So that's, most of our loans are going to be your conventionals, FHAs, and VAs. Mm -hmm. um, but jumbos and USDA, we have investors for. So mm -hmm. I would say primarily 90% of my loans are probably conventional FHA and VA. Mm. And uh, so how are you guys competitively? <laughs> are yeah. you guys competitive? I mean, that, at the bottom, at, at the end of the day, I think 
the buyers, they just want the best deal. Totally. Right? Yeah. So at the end of the day, how we meet the competitive edge, mm -hmm. there's a couple things I, would, I guess I'd throw in there. A correspondent lender's margins are going to be higher than a broker's or a banker's most of the time because we have local staff, we have right. local office. Right. You need to bring in your tax returns to me, you can. I'm here, I have a desk. Um, so our margins tend to run a tad higher. So what we have to do to be competitive is we have lots of relationships with correspondent lenders. Mm. So for example, if I were to go to sell a loan directly to Fannie or Freddie, my pricing might be a little bit worse compared to a correspondent lender like Penny Mac or Amerihome or Truist, Morgan Stanley, different investors that we work okay. with. They may have a pricing model that even though our margins are the same, their base rate's a tad better. Mm. So a lot of times to be competitive, we'll shift from a direct Fannie Freddie to a correspondent lender like New Res or some of these that are just priced a little more aggressively. Hmm. Okay. So, I mean, you kind of lost me a little bit with all those names. Yeah. Are you guys competitive at the yeah. end of the day? Yeah. At, the, at the end of the day, <laughs> what I like about Guild, uh, and I liked about Academy, but I actually yeah. like more about Guild is we Which, have, by the way, tell them why you're talking about Guild and Academy. Yeah, so I've been with the Guild for a month now yeah. because Academy was part of a merger to Guild. So I work for Guild Mortgage, but we're a division under Guild with the exact same bones and structure that Academy Mortgage was. So mm -hmm. same people, same staff new products, new programs, new loan origination software. So after being at Academy for decades, basically, now it's... Well, I've been at Academy for about four years, but after the office... But you were been, with them even, you were telling me before that, right? Yeah, yeah. so I was Academy, went to a different company, came back yeah, to Academy. Okay. Okay. Um, but yeah, same thing happened from First Mortgage Company to Academy. Mm -hmm. So I've been sitting within 10 feet of this desk for 11 of my 14 years in the industry <laughs> okay. under three different names. That's cool. But we all kind of do the same, you yeah. know, same thing. Yeah. But what I love about Guild is we have an unbelievable amount of investors. Mm. So for a jumbo, for example, I can choose and from- And a jumbo? Anything, well, some jumbo investors go below conforming loan limits. Okay. But a jumbo is generally defined as anything above Fannie Mae's conforming Which loan limits. Which is seven, what is it now? 747 like yeah. and some change. Mm -hmm. So with a jumbo investor, the name of the game is, or with a jumbo loan for competitive pricing, the name of the game is how many investors can I choose from? Mm. So uh, for the client that we're working with, I think I had 18 or 19 choices. And oh, I would have wow. had more with different credit scores and different loan down payment scenarios. But because we had so many to choose from, I could filter out 16 that were poorly priced, pick the two best, which ones fit with the guidelines for what we're trying to do for a self-employed bar with multiple businesses. And we were able to, I mean, incredibly competitive pricing. Hmm, Where if cool. I've got five or six jumbos in the queue, I may or may not have one that fits that box. Right. So the jumbo is the name of the game is having as many investors as possible. And that's actually true with conforming as well. Different investors will have different loans they like or don't like, kind of like mortgage insurance companies. Mm -hmm. Some mortgage insurance companies love when there's two borrowers. Some don't care. Some love high credit scores. Some are less credit score sensitive. Mm -hmm. So being able to shop six different mortgage insurance companies, make sure the client gets the best deal. Mm -hmm. Same thing in correspondent world. Being able to shop 25, 30 different investors from 15 to 30 year, adjustable rate, fixed rate, that gives us the best opportunity to present really competitive, aggressive pricing. What are some of the problems that you've seen borrowers encounter? Maybe give us like one juicy story. Sure, <laughs> uh, juicy story that's recently fresh in my mind is we had a borrower fill out a loan application and they listed under their own personal assets the entire down payment that they were gonna be using. Well, they didn't have the assets, those assets were gonna be a gift from a father. So when I run an FHA loan, FHA's automated underwriting system through Fannie Mae recognizes a gift and a borrower's own assets differently. Mm -hmm. Your own assets are a stronger qualifying factor than a gifted mm -hmm. asset. So we figured this out when we're, when we're getting all of their bank statements saying, hey, where's the funds that you mentioned that you had? Oh, I don't have them yet. It's a gift from it's dad. It's coming. <laughs> it's coming. And we go, uh-oh. That's yeah. a challenge. Yeah. So uh, little things like that. The biggest challenges that I'll say we run into is essentially a borrower not inputting information correctly or not understanding how Fannie Mae looks at it. Another one that we run into a lot is a self-employed borrower. They'll mm -hmm. say, well, yeah. I, I get this call all the time. Well, I make $200,000 a year as a self-employed borrower. I review their tax returns. I say, you wrote off everything under the sun, you make $60,000 mm -hmm. a year. And you can only qualify Mae. them according to their adjusted gross income, right? On, on a Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac loan where we're not looking at a, uh, like a non-QM or a brokered bank mm -hmm. statement, for just a correspondent loan, yeah, we're looking at adjusted net income. What advice do you like to give to buyers? The, the quickest, easiest advice to me from a lending perspective is meet and get the financing in order earlier than later. Mm -hmm. Assumptions kill deals. 
Uh, if you assume that a lender looks at a, a an income situation or asset situation a certain way that they that they actually don't, yeah. that can create a problem. Uh, one of the things that we run into a lot is credit reports. Credit Karma says, I have a 680, I'm in great shape. I pull a retail mortgage credit report, which is a different algorithm and often more conservative. And you don't have a 680, you have a 636. And so we don't want to find that stuff out the weekend we want to make an offer of a home. Mm. We want to find that stuff out a month in advance because there's a lot we can do to correct a credit repair or, or correct a credit profile. Or we can do a little bit of credit repair and bring that score up to either give a better loan program or a qualifying program that wasn't available before. Mm. Or there may be something that we can get a CPA letter to address a, a self-employed income question or even a W-2 bar with variable income. Mm. There's a lot of things that if we've got some time, we can solve. But if I get the loan application on Saturday afternoon and you want to make it out for Sunday by 5 p.m., mm -hmm. a lot of times that's that's not yeah. a reality. Right. Our last question. All right. Put your uh, your profit hat on. Okay. Where are rates headed this next year? What do you think? Where do you see kind of the general trend heading? Yeah. Um, anybody that tells you they know is misinformed because what we're dealing with right now are not technical data points in the market, we're dealing with political points. Mm. The big question is when will the Fed Reserve stop unloading their balance sheet mm. and when will they lower prices? Mm -hmm. And both of those are going to have the big impact on the mortgage-backed securities market. Mm -hmm. um, the third one that people talk a lot about is when do investors in bond markets feel optimistic about investing mm. in bonds? That's yeah. where a lot of the funding comes from. Yeah. So in the next year, I believe they're going to move lower, but not by a ton. Okay. In the next two years, I believe we're going to see that. I think 2025 is going to be the larger shift lower. Hmm. What the Fed has stated is that they want to see inflation around 2%. We know we're not getting to 2% in 2024. Hmm. We think we'll probably end the year at around 2.5%. Hmm. We also know the Fed wants to run the Fed funds rate at around 2% versus the 4.5 to 5 we're running right now. So that get, tells us that the Fed would desire to bring rates down when they feel comfortable with inflation. But some other external factors that can happen is if we start seeing recessionary indicators, um, unemployment rate ticks above five, those will start being signals to the Fed to start cutting rates sooner. Mm. So to predict how those things are going to happen isn't possible, impossible. but we do know the overall trend will move lower. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'd sent out an update at the end of last year and just said, hey, be careful, because right now the market's pricing in four to six cuts in 2024. But remember that a month ago, the market was pricing in zero. Mm. So these shifts monthly, yeah. what I'm kind of bracing folks for is we are going to see rates move slower, lower, slowly. Mm. But it's not, it doesn't do this. Right. It does this. Which honestly, that's better for the market. I mean, any, any fast shift in the market is mm -hmm. not good for everybody. I mean, we saw yeah. when rates were at zero for two years, look at what house prices did. It was terrible. And so. realistically, we still have inflation. So as much as like personally, I'm benefited by rates moving lower faster. Right. I do think the Fed's actually doing what they need to do. Yeah. We, we need to get a handle on prices. And we and, and, and I tell people, this is the huge advantage of buying at 6.75%. The house you're offering 450 on, you'd be offering 500 on yeah. or more totally if rates were still in the fours. So what they've done, is slowed growth and we needed that mm -hmm. and so i don't know where we'll land um i i would guess we'll dip into the fours i don't know that we'll go below four mm -hmm. in, in a while. i mean historically when how often has we have we been below four if you look at the, the very history rarely of the mortgage very rarely market. and what history tells us is it's not good for the market yeah totally. so we like that high fours low fives range I'd, I'd be thrilled if we can get there in the next 18 to 24 months Hope that was helpful, but how do correspondent lenders compare to broker lenders? Well, here's the answer.